<laughs> okay, so homework assignment. What was the paper? Paper. 75, 25, 25, 75 for IT and computer. Oh, talk about that. Yeah. Okay, so uh, was it, um, what is, ooh, that's good. That's some pumpkin creamer in here. Too much. Um, so it was comparing computer science to IT. Will you yeah. grab the lights while you're over there? In the, the second to the top button. Yeah. Second to the top button where you hit the, all the way to the top, then go down one button. Yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah. Go. No. No top. Go to the top. The top. Go to the top. That's the bottom. And then go down one. No. Yeah. That's the third. Yeah. I said go down one. He went down two. Who no. Ooh, ooh, ooh. That's the All right, hit the, hit, hit the top button. <laughs> Very top. That's the bottom. Hit the okay, okay. Now hit the one button below that. There, there we go. go. Got it. That, one. that length minus one. That's right. <laughs> that's extra credit. For real, I yeah. answered a question right, and you told me I was gonna get an A. Where's my extra credit? I'm a liar. Well, then I'm hoping you lied about that. Same one. thing. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, obviously. I noticed. I was just trying to hope that you had some type of Christian value. <laughs> I know my wife tried to make me go to church on Thanksgiving morning. Mm -hmm. Too busy playing Xbox. I beat Rise Son of Rome. Took that game down. So good. Who gave you that talent to be able to take down that game? Well, God did. Yeah, I mean, I go on Sundays. Well, Thursday morning, <laughs> I, got, I got stuff to do. Like play a video game. That's, that's right. Okay. That's just as bad as my pastor giving a summer vacation from Bible school or Bible class. Come on, so no, the kids are on vacation. So what? Jesus never stops. Well, yeah, but he's not Jesus. His kid is only like three months. Oh, his kids were on vacation. Oh, he was talking about all the kids. In the yeah, so he was going to have poor attendance. No, because there was a whole lot of old people there. So it didn't matter. Yeah, but old people there. Now we got a foot in a grave. It doesn't matter. Yes. They need to get to the Jesus even faster. <laughs> the kids got time. All right, so uh, let's talk about the... Uh, uh, computer science versus IT thing. So the argument I make is that computer science and IT are um, the are different sides of the same coin. That is, computer science is seventy five percent creation um, of solutions to problems and twenty five percent application of already created solutions, whereas IT is seventy five percent application of already created solutions and 25% creation uh, of solutions. Okay, so that's that's the premise. So now in the paper, what did I how did I ask you to defend this? I ask you to something about when is it preferable to make a new creation or a new solution for IT. Okay. So if you're an IT person, at what point do you use something that already exists mm -hmm. and Bend it to your will versus create something custom. Is that the question? One of them. Okay. So what, what's the answer? Here, I'll go ahead and open it up so I can actually read the... So when should a IT person utilize a tool that already exists? <laughs> okay. Tell me about that. They, the problem isn't going to end, and you're going to need a solution that the other pre-made solutions do not solve, or a combination of them do not solve, and it's also going to be something that's going to be in high demand. It'll be helpful for them to create something to replace in high demand for that particular solution. High demand. 
What do you mean by high demand? Like a lot of people need is going to need that solution, that new tool that you're going to create. Okay, so this is the argument for if you're making a brand new tool, yes. if you're creating a custom tool. If you find that there's going to be a large group of people that would benefit from this solution, mm -hmm. then it, from this specific solution, and there isn't already something available to solve that specific problem, it might be beneficial for you to create that tool because it kind of it solves two purposes. Mm -hmm. It solves your problem, but also benefits the IT community as a whole. Right. Okay, I'm fine with that. The IT professionals, when it's going to decide which one is the good and the best to create a custom software rather than like pre-made solution, he's going to see his resources, like programmer, developers, tools. Sometimes there's some people, I mean, if you're working with specialists, programmer, for example, Jaffa, and you can find anybody who can help you for this problem, to solve this problem, that means, and you have already one pre-made solution, that you are going to take this pre-made solution rather than the current one. Okay. So there might be situations where creating a custom solution might be preferable, yeah. but the resources aren't there to do it. Therefore, you have to kind of, you got to roll with the punches. You got to do what, there's the path of least resistance to get the job done, and then there's the correct path. And uh, some, or there's the ideal path, and then there's the path of least resistance. And sometimes those two are not the same thing. Um, so if it's something that requires you know, five or six human resources, and you don't have those human resources, yet there's a tool out there that sort of, kind of, with a little bit of uh, manipulation will let you kind of solve the problem, we just do it. Um, so I asked here, what's a type of problem um, that, that would exemplify this? Uh, I'll give you an example from here on campus. Uh, we are supposed to take attendance in our classes. I don't, because I'm lazy, but we're supposed to. Now, the way we're to take attendance, we use a tool here. Uh, it's kind of a, it, this is an interesting computer science problem in and of itself. Um, we use a tool here on campus called Banner which is something that a lot of universities use. It's a university, faculty, staff, student, collaboration tool, thingy, majiggy. Okay? It tries to solve a generalistic problem of the things that faculty need to do online related to university, things that staff needs to do online related to university, and things that students need to do online related to university. From a student's perspective, Registering for classes, dropping classes, adding classes, blah, blah, blah. Also, checking your bills. What's owed, what's not owed. It's or holding your account, looking at your current transcript, doing a ward report to find out, am I going to graduate, am I not going to graduate? That kind of stuff. From a faculty perspective, we have a student advising requirement. So I need to be able to become students and be able to add and remove them from classes and advise them, look, do transcript evaluations on individual students, things like that. From a staff perspective, you know, so staff should not be looking at your transcript. Um, I should only be looking at your transcript as it relates to you asking for advising privileges. I can look at your transcript, whatever I want, but from an ethical perspective, I should only be interested in your transcript if you are, you know, looking at classes. Hey, you did a good job with the pink today. Sam. <clears throat> you, you told her? I said at least you're wearing a little more pink today. No, last week was good. Last week she did the, last week she did her, her, her cool, uh, what's, what's the, what's the headdress thing called? Scarf. It's just called scarf. a scarf? Yes. There's not like a cooler foreign sounding name for that? No. It's literally just called a scarf. <laughs> Anyway, she had her cool, like, hippie one on last week. Like, I'm, I'm, I don't know, like, like, this one's more formal. Last week was like, yeah, I'm a college student, that's what it is. <laughs> this is like the more formal one. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah I know exactly what you are saying. <laughs> what was I talking about? You were oh, talking Banner. About we're talking about Banner. So, in any case, um... As a faculty member, I'm supposed to be taking attendance, and we're supposed to record this attendance inside a banner. 
Banner, surprisingly, does not have a good way of recording attendance. It's not built in there. So what we are supposed to do is we've solved this problem in a, we use something else in Banner to solve this problem. Where we go in and there's a different form in Banner that's, I don't know, for it's not midterm grades, it's not final grades, it's something else. And I can put in a number into a certain column in there, and that's supposed to represent the number of hours that somebody's been, has missed class or something like that. Um, so in Banner, they don't have a specific solution to what we need, but the university has decided they would like to keep track of attendance. Um, I know this because they yell at me when I don't do attendance. Well, my dean, they yell at my dean, then my dean yells at me, and then I ignore it. Until my chair yells at me, which means my dean yelled at my chair about me ignoring it. And then I go in and put stuff in there. That's, that's, why, why go through all that, that trouble? Because it's a headache to do. There isn't a good solution for att attendance. I literally have to go through it. It's, it's dumb. It's completely dumb. Why don't you build something new then? Well, th I mean, this is the discussion we're having. Yeah. So the... the no, no, I understand. I, I, get what, I get what you're at. <laughs> um, so the point is, is that so the university can get this data, they've decided to leverage something else in Banner that isn't being used and just say, put your attendance stuff there. I, I know it doesn't talk about attendance, but just put it there and we'll, we will interpret it correctly. So to your point, why don't we write something new? Why don't I write something new or somebody else here on campus write something new? Well, part of it is you have to work within the Banner infrastructure. So that's a learning curve in and of itself. And then you also need to work with the on-campus people to get access to the right things you need to have access to. Um, university, uh, rightly so, is very, very, very protective of student records. Should be, right? I mean, you don't want your transcripts, transcripts getting lost and that kind of stuff. So um, accessing things, making changes to Banner, is there's a lot of red tape that has to go through there. So unless it is absolutely critical if there is another way around it even if it doesn't make tons of sense even if it's not super convenient the fact that it's doable we've chosen to go with that solution that's an IT approach okay it's the path of least resistance it's not the best path but it's the path of least resistance it's not the ideal path I think of the word I used earlier but regardless uh, um, that would be a good example of a, a IT type decision where they had to say, okay, look, we need to do this. Doing it right would be prohibitively either A, expensive, B, time consuming, C, time consuming and expensive. <laughs> um, and we don't, you know, and because these guys are, you know, in the IT industry, you're almost always running around putting some fire out. You don't really have a lot of time to make progress on these long term projects. The, the, when the, the spirit is willing, <laughs> but if you, uh, um, I have yet to uh, be at any sort of institution where there is an IT department where people don't complain about the IT, IT department. Um, and it seems to me that all IT departments can't be bad. It seems to me that IT professional, being an IT professional is a fairly thankless job. When everything's working fine, nobody says anything. Right? Mm -hmm. Only when crap breaks. <laughs> when crap breaks, you're not doing your job. <laughs> so when you are doing your job, nobody notices. When you're still doing your job, but something bad that you was out of your control happens, people start screaming at you. That's what they remember. So I think IT, uh, as much as I'm a user of IT, um, and even, I mean, let's use another example here. For instance, I upload my videos for all my classes on YouTube. The university provides a service for us, uh, for, uh, what's it called? Panopto. Panopto. Why don't I use Panopto? It's unacceptable to me. I can't rely on it. You know, if I, I just spend four hours giving a lecture, I know that 95% of the time, the solution I've put into play here works. Software, software. Every now and then I might have a recording get crash, you know, crash or something, but you know, I do, see how many I do, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I do a minimum of 15 hours, 16, 16 hours of recording a week. And knock on wood, 
I don't remember the last time I had a recording fail. It was probably sometime in the last six months. But a small percentage of the time do I have a recording fail. It happens. It has happened. I'll get to the end of the class. I'll go up here to start, stop my recording. I'll see, oh, it, I wonder when that actually stopped. <laughs> Whenever the program crashed halfway through the class or whatever. So I might have captured five minutes of the class. I might have captured 45 minutes of the class. But, you know, it's like rolling the dice. But generally speaking, it's pretty reliable. Now, Panopto... I would say that my failure rate with Panopto was around 75%. Three out of four times, I failed capturing the lecture. Now, that's a service IT is providing to me. So, from a secondary IT professional perspective, I can choose to work with IT to try to get this problem resolved. It's one option, right? First of all, this isn't a tool IT created. This is a tool IT supports. Panopto is made from another company. Um, on top of that, I can only rely on IT giving me, um, timely support. Well, I can't rely on IT to give me timely support. Not necessarily because IT is bad. Um, you know, it depends on the week, if you ask me in my opinion. But most weeks, I mean, I, I have a, a soft spot for IT because I understand the problems they solve. They have to deal with the biggest problem that day, regardless of what they thought the biggest problem they were going to deal with tomorrow was yesterday. When they, if they show up to work today and the internet's down, it doesn't matter what they were planning on working on today. What they're working on now is getting the internet back up. So IT is a very unpredictable profession. So if I'm relying on these guys to in a timely manner help me get my Panopto working, A, it's kind of out of their control anyways because it's a third-party solution. And B, they might have bigger fish to fry. They have 7,000 students that need to be able to check their email, as opposed to one faculty member who's having trouble recording his courses. It just is what it is, right? That doesn't mean it's good, but I have chosen to take control of it on my own. Now, being a technologist, it's okay. I mean, I, I'm plenty capable of handling doing YouTube videos and things like that. So it, this is the easier solution to me. But if I was an English professor who maybe doesn't have a really strong technical background, they wouldn't be able to do what I'm doing, even though this is far easier than Panopto ever was, <laughs> to be honest. But, you know, it, they, those types of people need IT more than folks like me. And I think more often than not, the people who complain about IT are people like me or people who are more technologically savvy because they think they could do a better job. But they don't respect the job that IT people are actually doing. You know, and that's more of uh, some professional advice uh, for you when you get into the IT industry and you're doing this stuff. Recognize that you will often be underappreciated for what you do. Because people only notice when things go wrong. Does that make sense? Yes. I mean, it's the, it's the nature of the beast. Um, I mean, uh, Dr. Locklear, chair of the computer science department, I mean, he's, granted, he's in a very tough situation because he has to chair a department. So he has a responsibility to the department and stuff, but he's always had a fairly high friction um, relationship with IT because he started his IT here. Concordia didn't have an IT department. He was the IT department. Then we grew a computer science department, and computer science had its needs, and the rest of the university had its needs. Well, um, he is very pro-Concordia. Even if he doesn't trust that IT is going to give a good solution, he would prefer to rely on them to get the good solution rather than go and duplicate efforts. Um, and... More likely than not, that's not the path of least resistance. Kind of getting back to what we're talking about here. So he has to play more of a political game than me. I could just make a choice, you know, where he has to sit in on board meetings and things like that. And, you know, he yells at a dean who yells at so-and-so who then ignores it. It's, it's, it's just the, the way businesses work. Um, you know, but the point here being is that... Um, Often the best solution or the ideal solution is not the path of least resistance. Would it be great if I could use Panopto like this university has intended for us to be able to do and is, and is paying for? We pay for Panopto support. Absolutely, that would be ideal. 
But that's not going to happen when I need to record a lecture tomorrow morning at 10. And another one tomorrow at 1.10. And two lectures tonight. You know, it, I'm on a, you know, I'm on a time frame. And I have a solution that works for me. So, you know, I have to choose the path of least resistance, even though it kind of goes against university standards. I mean, more than likely, me recording my lectures and posting them the way I post them probably violates some sort of university policy, Is my would be my guess. It's probably written somewhere. Nobody reads it. Nobody knows of it. But my guess is if you hunt it, there's probably some sort of intellectual property policy that's technically being broken. Nobody really cares. I mean, you know, so it's not like they're going to haul me down or something. But the point is, is that, you know, it's probably against policy, even though it's the path of least resistance for me. So, you know, that's that would be an example of a problem that's not being solved right, necessarily. Although, I mean, you can't really argue YouTube solves streaming video pretty well. Right? <laughs> kind of in the business of streaming video. Um, you know, but... Uh, uh, that would be a good example of kind of what we're talking about with this paper. Um, so let's see what else. When, when is it preferable to create a custom software solution? What types of problems might an IT professional use? Um, what types of problems might an IT professional solving? Yeah, I, mean, I wrote, what is this? Oh, I think I made fun of myself last time, didn't I? Yes, you did. Okay, good. Um, using computer programming as a tool. So... Did we wrap our minds around that? Like, what kind of problem would we solve? Can you give me an example? So I've given you some examples from my world. What kinds of, ex what, what problems might we, as IT people, try to solve using a programming tool versus using a pre-created solution? Do you have a specific example of a problem? Well, so, I mean, let's kind of talk about generalistic problems, problems that all business people have to deal with. So, for instance, uh, email and calendaring. Any medium and large size corporation, even relatively small corporations, need to uh, um, have some sort of shared calendar. It's, a, it's part of business, right? Yeah. So let's say that you're an IT professional at some place, and somebody comes up and he says, you know, we really need to have... Email and shared calendar. Are you immediately going to say, okay, well, I'm going to go ahead and start writing this. Or I'll probably use Java or I'll use C Sharp. Um, let's see, what, what does it need to look like? Is that the first thing you're going to think about? No. In the IT industry, more than likely, if you're on a Windows platform, your problem just got solved. Buy a license for Office 365. Now you have Outlook with a calendar, with email. And, oh, by the way, you also have business applications like Word and Excel and SharePoint, done. We're done. <laughs> Problem solved. Wrote a check and we're done. Um, so, how much did that check cost? Well, I mean, let's put this into perspective. How much is a subscription to Office 365 for a year? You know, if you buy it in, you know, some sort of business package, maybe it's, um, uh, let's say it's 200 bucks a year. 200 bucks a year per person. It, that's got to be ballpark. You probably, if it's an upgrade license, you could probably get it less. If it's an academic license, it's less, you know, whatever. But $200 per seat per year, but it literally is ready now. So if you are working for an IT place, or you're the IT support for a company, and that company comes to you and says, oh, we need to have email accounts set up uh, and shared calendaring. How long is this going to take? And you say, oh, I can have it done in 20 minutes. I just need a credit card. Chances are you already have a uh, site license for Microsoft. You know, so most places, they don't even think about the licensing fee. They just pay Microsoft a yearly fee to have access to all of Microsoft's software within a certain tier. You know, so you have, a, you know, there's an academic tier. There's a small business tier. There's an enterprise business tier. So Microsoft doesn't get that granular with it. They say, look, here, we have all this software. You want our enterprise license? Give us this, this many thousands of dollars per year and it's good for this many licenses for this many people and you're good and that's where microsoft makes a lot of their money with site licenses but the point is from an it professional's perspective you just set up shared calendaring that's not a very good ringtone usually there's like music or something that was just like a like a like a doorbell but in any case um 
as an IT professional, you literally just solved a problem by writing a check, probably the company's check, right, in 20 minutes. Can you make any argument whatsoever that that wasn't the right decision? It was the path of least resistance, certainly, right? And do you think you could individually, even given the time and money, write a solution that is superior to Outlook? The best answer you could give me is maybe. But realistically, as an individual or even a small team, you're not going to write something that competes with Outlook. I mean, it's, the, people knock Microsoft products all the time. We've all heard it, right? People rip on Microsoft. I'm a big Apple user, but there's nothing wrong with Microsoft. I mean, realistically, Microsoft, it's shocking how well Microsoft software works. I mean, it's less shocking how well Apple software works because Apple controls both sides of the coin. Take iPhone as an example. Apple writes the software for their own hardware. They control both sides. No wonder it works pretty well. Apple makes OS X. This is, I'm running the newest one, Mavericks. It makes it for their own hardware. No wonder it works pretty well. Microsoft does not make hardware. Outside keyboards and stuff like that. And Xboxes, I guess. But they don't make computer hardware. So Microsoft writes products like Windows and Word and Excel. And those software packages need to run on a thousand different computers. Different hardware configurations, different speed computers, different size monitors. I mean, even within Apple, there's only like maybe six different screen sizes that Apple needs to design their software to work on. Even across all their products. Six. How many different screen resolutions do you think Microsoft needs to design Windows to work for? More than six? <laughs> so whenever people rip on Microsoft, um, you know, I like to take that as an opportunity to educate them that Microsoft is solving a very, very, very difficult problem. Not only have they created the industry standard for office applications and the industry standard for desktop operating systems, which isn't going away anytime soon, right? I mean, fine, Mac OS X at Mavericks, great operating system, I don't have any problem with it, but Microsoft is never losing their dominance in desktop operating system market share. Maybe they've gone from 97% to 94% install base or something like that. I, I highly doubt they'll ever drop much below 90% <laughs> of an install base for desktop. It's a pretty solid win for, <laughs> for, for Microsoft on, the, on, on desktop platforms. Um, now, having said that, how many of you are Windows users in here? I, mean, I guess it's most of us, right? Uh, maybe go the other direction. How many of you are Mac users? Two or three? Two or three Mac users. So the Mac users, we're pretty happy with what, what we have, right? No real complaints with, with Mac stuff. You don't usually hear complaints with Mac stuff outside of price. Fine. So the rest of you are Windows users. How many of you really have, truly, have any complaints about your Windows experience? How many of you are running Windows 7? <laughs> Who's running Windows 8? You're running Windows 8? Mm -hmm. um, why do you wish you were running Windows 7? I know that it sucks. <laughs> well, I'm Sorry. used to Windows 7, but Windows 8 stuff kind of pops in all the time and moves to one spot on the screen and it <laughs> gets your start menu up and you don't care about it. I think the reality is, I think you answered your own question in that you're used to it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean... Um, I only run, I mean, I have, a, I have a Windows install on here. So, I mean, I run Windows when I do development. So, you know, sometimes I have to do .NET development or something. You can only do that on Windows. Um, so, I'm running Windows 8 on there. You know, after you get past the learning curve, there's nothing wrong with Windows 8. It's fine. Um, I can tell you, though, and this is actually related to what we were just talking about. This is an interesting factoid. Um, for those of you who noticed that I, I'm using a different laptop today than I usually am, I've been having to do a lot of software development, so I brought in my, my Retina display, um, MacBooks. I've been in a bunch of different places having to write some stuff. So I put a Windows 8 virtual machine on here. 
And uh, the retina display for the Mac is a super high resolution screen. It's 2560 by 1536 or something like really much higher than a higher high definition. I can tell you one thing. Windows was not designed to run. Not that it doesn't run well under that. Windows was not designed to be usable at that high of a resolution visually. So like I'm looking at my Mac here. I'm running this at, at full resolution and it looks just fine. Um, I mean, actually, it's at, not at full resolution right now because I'm plugged into this monitor, which limits my resolution because I can only go as high as that guy is. But it looks great on the Mac side. Why? Well, Apple knew that they had a product that had this high resolution, and they designed their operating system to look right on that resolution. Well, Microsoft did not. Why? Because Microsoft doesn't control their own hardware. They have to write it to look good on all configurations. I'll tell you what, when I installed Windows 8 and had it running at 2560 by 1536, my eyes burned. Things were so small. I mean, I spent all my time going into settings, and I, I was turning on things for, like, handicapped folks, <laughs> like zooming and stuff. <laughs> um, and the thing is, that's not a knock on Microsoft. Microsoft is solving such a harder problem than Apple is. So the fact that most of us who are Microsoft users don't really have a major problem with our, with our uh, experience is shocking. Even, in, even micro, uh, Windows Vista which is the last time Microsoft really got screamed at. There was nothing wrong with Vista, the operating system. What was the problem? Well, it was annoying to use. It was stable. It was secure. It was, it was more than secure. But it was annoying because it constantly asked you, are you sure you want to let this happen? Are you sure you want to let this happen? Well, why is that? Why did they have to be so annoying? Well, you can argue that well, they didn't really have to be so annoying, but... Have you, how many of you have ever heard the statement that, well, Windows has viruses, but Apple doesn't have viruses? Have you heard that before? Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you think that's true? No. Yeah. Well, the fact is, it actually is mostly true, but not for the reason why you think. It's not that Apple is immune to viruses. They're based on a Unix operating system, which is arguably more <laughs> secure than Windows, um, a Windows NT-based operating system, but not... I mean, we're talking 5% or something, nothing ridiculous. Why are there so many more, so many more viruses for Windows than there are for Mac? For users, yeah. <laughs> it's nothing to do with how easy it is to break into. If you're somebody who writes viruses, you want to attack the most number of people. Are you going to attack the 4 trillion people running Windows or the 7 people <laughs> running Mac? <laughs> So, you know, once again, the fact that Windows has so many viruses isn't a knock on Windows. In fact, if anything, it's a boon because it's so popular. Does that kind of make sense? So as IT professionals, you need to be able to understand this stuff in the right light. And keep in mind, you're hearing this from an Apple user. So, you know, this is an Apple fan telling you that Microsoft is good. <laughs> so, you know, don't bite the hand that feeds type thing. We wouldn't be in the world we are today with computing if it wasn't for Microsoft. We need that beast. And by the way, Apple's not standing in a corner looking so cute either. You know, they do the same, you know, unethical business practices and crap like that that Microsoft does. They're both beasts, you know. It's, it is what it is. But, you know, um, the thing is when people say Microsoft sucks, I take exception because... From a computing perspective, it's shocking how well Microsoft software works, given the problem they're solving. Shocking. You know, and we could take that exact same argument and take it to mobile. How many of you are Android users in here? How many of you are iPhone users in here? Okay. Most iPhone users would say, oh, well, iPhone's better than Android. Blanketly, right? Android users would say, well, Android's better than iPhone. Well, I can tell you factually, I think that there is very little argument that the end user experience on iPhone is superior to the end user experience on Android. But let's call it today like 5%. Android, though, is solving the Microsoft problem. 
Apple is solving the Apple problem. They're writing OS, they're writing iOS, the software for iPhone, for their own hardware. Google, the people who make Android, they're writing the Android operating system for 5,000 different smartphones. It's shocking how good Android is when you consider that. If we, would, if we roll back the clock, three, how, many go, how many of you were Android users three years ago who are still Android users today? Okay. Android three years ago compared to Android today, no competition. Android has, a, has improved exponentially in three years. Three years ago, nobody could make any sort of rational argument that the Android experience was even close to the iPhone experience. Today, you could make a legitimate argument. I would still argue iPhone's got the edge. But Android is shockingly close, especially when you consider that they're solving significant, a significantly harder problem. They're actually solving a much harder problem than even Microsoft is solving. Because we're just now moving into this age where mobile technology, these computers that go in our pocket, are getting faster and faster and bigger and bigger and higher resolution and more gadgets attached to them and Bluetooth this and Bluetooth that. The technology is changing so much, so fast. And Android is keeping up shockingly well. So, again, from an Apple person, if somebody says Android sucks, let's talk in a year or two. I mean, I, I can only see Google closing that gap. And now that Apple has lost their, you know, lost their <laughs> Steve Jobs, <laughs> they, you know, they don't, you know, they're still cool, but I, they've certainly lost a little bit of their edge. Nobody can argue that that hasn't happened, right? You know, you lose a little bit there, and then you have a company like Google that's no slouch. Working so hard on Android. I mean, from a consumer perspective, we're in a pretty good place. I mean, now you got two... You know, two big fish fighting with each other as to who's going to have the best mobile experience moving forward. And who knows who's going to win. Three years ago, we said Apple was easily winning. Today, I would make the argument that Apple's barely winning. Let's talk next year. The year after that. The year after that. Right now, Apple's losing ground <laughs> is, is, is the punchline, right? Really, Apple only controls the market and tablet space at this point. Smartphone, it's a relatively 50-50 split, um, you know, ish. The, the, the install base is a little bit, uh, uh, the numbers are a little weird on the install base when you consider the number of different devices Android's on versus the six devices I, iOS is on. But regardless, let's call smartphones relatively a 50-50 split. But tablet is still a pretty heavy iPad win. I would say iPads are probably representative of 85% of the usable tablet market. You know, they have a pretty big lead there. But um, it's really shocking to me how much better Android has gotten today than they were three years ago. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. So they're solving that Microsoft problem that we're talking about here. So... Um, I have an example, a real yeah. world example for the pre-made versus um, custom. At, at my job, we process dental claims and we have like three different lines of business they moved over to a new processing system right now they have three custom business units that separated out because each one is so individual that okay if they took like a pre-made like mold they would have to do more you know more within there to house everybody so they have three different well they actually have four because we have one client that's in one of the units that's its own beast on its own so they put it in okay. its own complete separate business unit so they customize each one instead of going with a pre-made solution <laughs> it makes it a pain i test like the user interface it makes mm -hmm. it a pain but because we have to test every single one to make sure that it's working okay okay whereas if it was one big one we don't have to test it one time <laughs> right but you're saying that one big one wouldn't suffice right. for <laughs> the individual needs yes of, of each yep. client or commercial Right. So, again, in that situation, the most efficient solution is not the the solution. The path of least resistance is not the ideal solution. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is the is is the punchline? Um, yeah. So I mean, it's 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 really interesting. Um, but I think even that that whole this whole concept of Microsoft and Android and things like that 
really comes back to what we said, you know, 20 minutes ago about IT is a thankless industry. You know, people only complain when it's broken. They're not impressed when it works. You know, it's, a, it's just the nature of the beast. So be prepared. Because people are just going to complain to you. Because when you're doing your job and everything's working, well, that's what they pay you for. <laughs> like, do you realize I haven't slept in four days so that you could check your email? <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. So it's, um, uh, I think it's a very interesting um, premise that even technology folks uh, forget. Um, you know, and we can take it outside of technology and just uh, human beings in general, a lot of times we discount um, how important certain industries are to us. And we take it for granted when we complain about this, that, or the next thing. Um, you know, people complain about the police, things like that. Like, oh, well, you know, the traffic is really, really slow because, you know, there's this accident up there and they're routing everybody around and stuff like that. You know, I just had this the other day. I was coming home from Concordia going to my house and there was some sort of accident, I'm assuming, uh, on Port, Port Washington Road heading north. And there was ambulances going down there. I mean, you know, somebody might have gotten hurt. Somebody probably got hurt. Yet, I felt inconvenience that, they, mm -hmm. that the police were routing me around through country roads. Like, oh, I got to get home because I got to watch TV. You know, we, we often take for granted when people are doing their jobs, right? It's just, it's, it's, it's the nature of human beings. That's just how we are. So, um, okay. So, you know, that, I think that gives us a pretty good overview of, uh, this whole IT versus computer science thing. I mean, I think when you, computer scientists in general will almost always lean towards creating a solution on their own, unless there's a good reason not to. Where I think IT professionals will almost always lean towards using a pre-existing solution, unless there's not, unless there's a good reason not to. That kind of makes sense? I think that sort of summarizes it. Um, and that's where I like to think of the, the two as being different sides of the same coin. You know, computer science is not better than IT. IT is not better than computer science. We are solving the same problem. Um, computer science people usually are not allowed to deal with customers. They're the geeks in the back closet. IT people have to deal with customers. And that's actually a very difficult problem. Because you need to be able to talk human to customers, but talk geek to the other IT folk. You got to be that dude in the middle. Does that make sense? So, you know, computer science people could just be geeks all the time. Like, look, well, they don't let us talk to people. <laughs> so we can just be freak shows all the time. IT people need to fake it with real people. <laughs> so it's, uh, um, it's very interesting, I think. Um, Maybe the main motivation behind a paper like this is uh, that I like to throw out the uh, throw out there is I believe strongly that the impression a lot of IT people have, specifically at the undergraduate level. I think the graduate level we're a little more mature. We kind of understand the world a little bit more, like you know whatever. But the undergraduate level is we see people going into IT because they want less programming. They look at IT as computer science without programming. And that's, that really couldn't be further from the truth. I don't think there's actually any less programming with IT than there is with computer science. The programming is different. Computer science folk might be creating business applications, where IT people are creating a bunch of utilities um, that for you know creating you know user accounts in bulk, doing database backups, things like that. Um, you might be able to argue that computer scientists are creating software that the end user We'll see where IT people are creating software that, for the most part, only other IT people will see, but it's still programming. So my argument there is that programming does not define the discipline. Computer science is not programming. IT is not programming. Computer programming is a tool that both of those disciplines use for various reasons. You know, I say in computer science that computer programming is to a computer scientist as a hammer is to a carpenter. The tool we use to solve problems, same thing is true with the, the IT professional. Um, 
you know, IT professional leans a little bit more heavily on their past experience with other software packages, where a computer science person leans a little bit more, more heavy on their past experience of dealing, of creating tools with different programming languages. But there's tons of overlap there. Um, so it's a very interesting thing, and you know, this is, that's where this topic kind of comes from, is really to shove c computer programming, as big as a, of a programming fan as I am, to shove computer programming into the back and understand that it's not the discipline. Computer programming is a tool that people in technology use to solve problems. It doesn't define IT or define computer science. Kind of make sense? So, interesting little factoid to kind of keep, keep your mind on when you're hating programming or something like that. Just a tool, just like a lawnmower that's not working right. <laughs> so, so sometimes you got to put some new oil in it or mess with some wires or whatever or get a new lawnmower. Kick it. Kick it. Yeah, you got to kick it. That's how you fix lawnmowers. That's yes. right. My brother actually once did that with a computer. He literally put a dent in the side of his computer. This was back desktop computer days. <laughs> I say desktop computer uh, yeah, days. They, they are still. Yeah, but how many of you? How many of you have a desktop computer? At work. <laughs> yeah, but isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. That you know now when we think computer, at the very least, you are predisposed at least a little bit to assuming a laptop, aren't you? Yeah. Where ten years ago, a computer meant a desktop. That's it. Yeah, now they're interchangeable. Yeah, now somebody says, what kind of computer do you have? Well, is it, is it a laptop or a tablet? <laughs> so 10 years from now, you know, laptops will be a thing of the past. Like, what are you carrying that around for? Well, that opens? <laughs> All right. So uh, programming assignment was something with fractions, I think. Okay, create a fraction class that has two private fields, a numerator and a denominator of type big integer. Okay, let's look at this. So I'll come into, let me open up. Uh, so I'm going to create a new. Oh yeah, you posted that, but I don't think you made it public. You were for coaching last week. We were the 16th, so I think. Really? I had somebody text me and ask me, and I told them it was there, and then they didn't complain. <laughs> this? Yeah. I just rewatched the video. Viewable. Yeah, it's viewable by everybody. Interesting. Yeah, right. Some way, do you have that under Unit 4? No, it's Unit 3. Class code from 11-27-13. I like how this is just not broken. <laughs> it's just slow. Maybe that's the problem. <laughs> Angel's broken. Like always. Was anybody able to see the class code from class? Mm -mm. <coughs> I just watched the video. Yeah. Okay. Well, sorry. Sorry, Well, somebody, like I said, somebody, uh, I think you texted me, didn't you? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I went online, I guess it's there, so I, you know, I politely replied saying, oh yeah, it's there now, like, it was there 20 minutes ago before you asked, too. <laughs> hmm. Well, let me, uh. Did you ever save it? Yeah, I mean, it's, I, you're, you're looking at it. No, I mean, like, save the setting. Yeah. I mean, you just saw me open it, and it showed me showed you what the current setting is. Just like out of curiosity. I mean, it's it's too late now, obviously. But uh, let me go in and let's do the settings for it. I'll go to access. It's viewable by everyone, but let me change it to students maybe, and hit save. There it is. It's there. Mm -hmm. Now let me switch it back to everyone and hit save. Still there? No, it is. 
Yeah. 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 Yeah, something must have. You were having trouble saving it that day. Remember? And then. Yeah, like right at the end, it wasn't like... So my guess is the... So this is probably what happened, going from a problem-solving perspective. More than likely, the default is everyone from a drop-down perspective like this for how it saves it. But what it does is initially is it inherits from the folder you put it into. And I put it into the Unit 3 folder, which by default makes everything private. So even though this guy had the... It looked like it was open to everyone. It actually wasn't open to everyone because when I initially added it, it made itself private. Mm -hmm. So it was just showing the first option in that drop-down box, not that it was actually set. So it was deceiving. Which actually kind of sucks because I should, um, and more than likely, it's a it's a user error. There probably is a way to do it. Um, instead of risking it? Is that what yeah. you're saying? Yeah, instead of having to go back in there later on. Well, here, why don't I just unlock this? Look at you. So bright. So brilliant. So now everything in Unit 4 should be open, I think. Yeah. Um, so, uh, what was I saying? Saying something. You were talking I'm sure it was brilliant. You were talking about the big SHI. Well, before that, I mean, after that, but before this. You were talking about the issue of the code not being saved. Mm. Mm. I remember what I was saying. It would be interesting if there was a way for me to become a student. There probably is. There's probably a student view. So after I do something, I could just say, okay, treat me like I'm a student viewing this. What can I see? You know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I think there actually is a way to do that. I just don't care enough to look into it. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> Would you rather me lie to you? <laughs> no. I appreciate the honesty. All right, so let's uh, let's look at some of the stuff. So I'm going to go ahead and um, I've been experimenting with go full with going full screen on this stuff lately. Interesting. So I'm going to right click and we're going to create a new class called Fraction. Right? And fraction is going to have two private fields. Well, actually, big integer, right? Yeah. I don't want to have to spell denominator very often, so I'm just going to call it num and denom. And then we'll go ahead and import java.math to give us our big integer. So there's our two private fields. We'll create a public constructor. We'll have these guys taking a long num and a long nom. We'll probably end up making a couple of different constructors, but... Just for our starting point here, we'll have it taken a num, uh, two longs and create our big integers out of that. And we'll say num is equal to new big integer num. So this dot num is equal to new big integer Let me go look at the... How did we create big integers last time? Make sure I'm doing it the way I showed you how to do it. Oh, string. string. Out of a string, okay. <coughs> so, empty string concatenated with whatever num is. And this dot denom is equal to new big integer. Empty string concatenated with denom. All right. So, that will build our fraction. And let's see, what else am I supposed to do? Unit three, homework six. Fraction needs to be able to display itself. So let's go do that. So I'll create a public void display method. 
display method will do system dot out dot print len. This dot num concatenated with a slash concatenated with this dot denom, uh, and this will. Have we looked at the two string method yet in here? Okay. Well, we'll end up doing this today. It's fine. Um, because the reality is we're actually calling this dot num dot two string and this dot denom dot two string to make it work right. That'll make sense later, so it's not that important. Um, so let's go ahead and test our early fraction here. So I'll come into can't stand all this clutter. No, I'm just gonna delete it. All right, so we're going to create a fraction. F is equal to a new fraction 1, 2. And we'll say F dot display. And hopefully we get 1 half out of the screen. Okay, so we're able to create fractions now. Let's see, what else is this to be able to do? Uh, a fraction should be able to add itself to another fraction, returning a new fraction in reduced form. Okay, so go back into our fraction class. We're going to create public fraction add. This guy's going to take a fraction f as a parameter, and we're going to add two fractions together. Well, what does it mean to add two fractions together? Well, we need to get the common denominator, right? Greatest common denominator? Well, let's go ahead and just do the cross multiplication first. That's the way I like doing this. So let's do an unreduced form first. So what I'm going to say is I'm going to say big integer new num big integer new denom. So we have a new numerator and a new denominator we need to create. The new denominator is going to be equal to what? It's going to be equal to the, the two denominators multiplied together, right? So if I have one third and I have one half, my denominator is going to be a six. Okay. So this guy will be equal to a new, actually here we'll do it this way equal to this dot denom dot multiply f dot now I need to be able to get my denominator right so that means I need to be able to create I need to do source generate getters and setters and for right now we'll just give ourselves both of them to make this easy so I have all those guys now. So multiply by f dot get denominator. That makes sense? So that's my new denominator. What's my new numerator? My new numerator is taking this is numerator times the other denominator and adding to that the other numerator times this is denominator. So new numerator is going to be equal to parenthesis this dot numerator dot multiply f dot get denominator. Right? So that guy right there will give me a the numerator times the other guy's denominator. And what do I want to do with that? I want to add that to what? I want to add that to the big integer that's returned by f dot get numerator, sorry, dot multiply this dot denominator.
So this dot numerator multiplied by f dot denominator, that gives us a big integer. Then we'll add to that big integer f dot get numerator multiplied by this dot denominator, just like that. So that's my new numerator. So now I need to be able to build a fraction out of two big integers, right? Because I have my new numerator and I have my new denominator, so I need to create a, another constructor for fraction. Public fraction, big integer num, big integer denom, and say this dot num is equal to num, this dot denom is equal to denom, and now I can create a fraction out of big integers. So I'll return a new fraction with new num, new denom for right now. This is not going to reduce it, but it gives me my starting point. That make sense? All right, so now I should be able to go, I should be able to create two fractions. Fraction F2 is equal to new fractions do one third. And then I should be able to say F dot add F2 dot display. So F dot add F2 is going to boil down to a fraction, right? Then I'm going to tell that fraction to display itself. So it should display one half plus one third. Giving me five sixths. Make sense? That's equivalent to me doing this. Fraction F3 is equal to F dot add F2 F3 dot display. So this one line accomplishes the same thing that these two lines accomplish with the one exception that after this one line is done, I have no way of getting to my fraction that's 5 sixths. After these two lines are done, F3 holds my fraction 5 sixths. Make sense? So we'll see we get 5 sixths twice here. But then similarly, I can say F3 dot display again, and we can see we can keep getting F3 over and over again, where I've lost the ability to get the original 5 sixths. All right, questions about that? So now we need to be able to reduce this dude, right? So to reduce them, I need to go and get my greatest common divisor. Well, let's hit YouTube, hit YouTube, hit the internet, uh, GCD algorithm. I know we had this last time, but as you saw, I deleted it. Ooh, here's a recursive version of it. Oh, is there? Yeah. But I didn't tell you how to use that. I did technically show you how to use the um, the documentation for it. I'll allow it. Um, I'd rather write it. Let's just write one of these. Although I am interested in the recursive version, that looks, that looks kind of fun, actually. So, we'll come in here, and we're going to create a private function. Big integer, gcd. That's going to take a fraction f as well as this current fraction and give us the greatest common divisor. I'm going to paste this code in, even though we're going to 
So in our code here, A is this, and B is F. So here we can even name this, uh, no, screw it, let's leave it as F. So while A and B are not, uh-oh. Thought we had an emergency. We're good. I may or may not have hit the power button. Okay, while A and B are not equal to each other, which means that this dot, well, actually just this, dot equals, hmm, actually it's going to be interesting. How do I ask if two fractions are not equal to each other? Hmm? See, greatest common denominator actually does not take in a fraction. It takes in a big integer, b. We're going to actually write this better. It'll give us an opportunity to show something. I'm going to take in a big integer b and a big integer a. And we're going to make this guy static. We're going to make it static. I'm going to ask you why we made it static in a few minutes. It might potentially be a quiz, so keep that to yourself and think about it. So while a dot equals b, while that is not true, If A well, let's see. Yeah, it does. What greater than? So really you almost had to use the uh Okay, well, this will be interesting. So, I want to say while well, A and B are not equal to each other, right? So, while A dot subtract B dot equals Well, that is not true. While it is not true that a minus b is equal to zero, the big integer zero. And if you didn't know about big integer zero here, in fact, we're going to assume it because I don't want anybody having any dirt on me. Literally solve this using only tools you had. Hmm. Did I? Mm -hmm. Oh, all right. All right. So while a minus b is not equal to zero, that means they're not equal to each other, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So while that's true, what am I going to do? I'm going to set a equal to a dot subtract b. Else, I'm going to set b equal to b dot subtract a. In the end, I'll return a.
make sense? So that is my GCD function for big integers. And then what I'll do is inside my add function, before I return, I'm going to create a big integer div. Let's call it gdiv. And we're going to call this guy I'm going to call my fractions greatest common divisor, passing at the numerator and the denominator, giving me gdiv. And I'm going to return a new fraction that is new num dot divide gdiv and new dom denom dot divide gdiv. That makes sense? So I'll get my greatest common divisor by calling greatest common divisor on the numerator and denominator after I've done my math. And then I'll return a brand new fraction created by dividing the numerator by that divisor and dividing the, de de the denominator by that divisor. Make sense? Now with our current set of fractions, I don't think we get any reduction. Did I click? Why do you hate me? <coughs> Why isn't it running? Did we have this problem last time? Mm -hmm. If a dot subtract b is not equal to zero, then set a equal to a subtract b. Otherwise, set b equal to b subtract a. Do that for as long as a and b are not equal. I'm guessing this is an infinite loop. That equals must not actually compare them. So I must need to say this. Oh, hold on. Great. Greater than B. This doesn't check to see if it's greater than. If A minus B We need to simulate greater than. Well, do, uh, is there a greater than? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, but we didn't show that in class. I want to. I want to make this awesome. A dot subtract B. So if we had 5 and we subtracted 4, 5 is greater than Yeah, it is weird, but we're gonna make we're gonna have an awesome solution. Right, but then you get it as an int. What happens if the values get too big? Yeah, I want to deal with them as big integers because I want this to literally work for arbitrary size numbers. Well, yeah, but you would still get from you. Would, so it would be a dot. Um, was it int value or something like that? All right, but but how how are you going to compare a and b? So it doesn't matter when you do it. I'm just saying, how can you compare a to b? Yeah. You say you want to check before this line. Yeah. But how am I checking? How are you recommending we check? My I still have to ask, is new num greater my, than... My, minus one, minus, and if it's like less than zero, go away. Right, but how do I ask, is it less than zero? Like, new num and new denom are, are big integers okay. here, just like they are in the other place. Yes, if new num minus more than like... So there, there isn't a difference. So we have to come up with a, uh, there used to be, I think it used to be like GT or something. Very interesting. All right. Well, we're going to write a helper function here then. How do we ask is a certain number greater than a certain other number if both of those numbers are big integers? All right. So... We are going to write a function in here, private. Okay, so we're going to write a function here, private. Static. Boolean. Is greater. This guy's going to take in a big integer a and a big integer b, and it's going to return true if a is a bigger number than b and false otherwise. Huh? 
I'm going to convert it to a string. So I'm going to say, um, so once I get it as a string, now I need to compare strings to each other. Make sense? So how do I check to see if I have a string, one, two, three, and I have another string, four, five, six, how do I ask, is this string greater than this string? Okay, so how about, uh, how about that? Well, can I check the last digits? Well, no, that's true. If they're all zeros, then we might have a problem. But if one of the strings is longer than the other, if we assume that there's not padded, there's real numbers in there, the longer string is the bigger number. Correct? Yep. So if a dot two string dot length is less than B dot two string dot length. If that's a true statement, then we can just return true. If the length of the first guy is less than the length of the second guy, then it must be a smaller number. Else if, I'll steal this line. And change the B and the A. If the second number is actually shorter than the first number, then return false. Else, they must be the same length. Correct? If they're the same length, now I need, <laughs> I need to look at them one character at a time, starting with the very first. So, for int i is equal to zero, i is less than uh, a dot two string dot length i plus plus. So, we know they're both the same length, so it doesn't matter if I use a or b's length there. It's the same. Okay, and what I want to do is I want to ask the question if the character I'm currently looking at is larger in A than it is in B, then return true. Correct? Otherwise, move on to the next character. If, now the way I get the current character I'm looking at in A is A dot two string dot char at I. That's how I get an individual character, correct? How do I get that guy as a number? Hmm? Okay, except integer.parse int takes a string. So I'm gonna take Right here, this is, give me the current character I'm looking at, concatenated onto the empty string, building a string, then parse the integer out of that string. If that string is less than B's, let me minimize this. B's version of that. If that's a true statement, 
What am I going to do? Return true. Now, if I got through that entire for loop, return false because they must be equivalent, right? Return false. All right, so let me make sure I have all my parentheses right here. Okay, so this guy closes this guy. This guy closes that percent. This guy closes that guy, this guy closes that guy, this guy closes that guy. So you got one extra. Okay. So now I should have a function that will return true if the first big integer is less than the second big integer. Do you see if they're all zeros? Yeah. Uh, I think we can assume it's not for this example. Uh, a negative number could be a problem in this. So we could also say, for our example here, let's just assume we're only dealing with positive numbers. But certainly, those are things we should be concerned with. So I'll say if fraction dot is greater, is that what the, yeah, if A is greater than B. A, B, if that's a true statement, then do this, else do this. Oh, well, we already got a negative number. It must be because these guys don't, uh, that's not how you compare. So if a dot subtract b dot Doesn't look like equals. Works out here for us. We just compare two, that would do it, but I didn't show you that. So, okay, so I'm going to do this. We subtract those guys from each other, and then we call two string. Dot char at zero not equal to the character zero. So if I take my first number, I subtract from it my second number, then I convert that to a string, then I get the character at bucket zero of that, and I compare that character to a zero. As soon as they are equal to each other, A minus B will be a zero, therefore char at zero will be a zero when I compare it to the char zero. So I think this is the equivalent. This is actually kind of a fun problem. System to out that print line A I just want to see what's happening to A and B. I mean, the easy solution is just use GCD, but I'm 
because we can make this work really easily by just using the big integer <laughs> GCD. But I'm, I'm determined. <clears throat> okay, so we start off with 5 and 6. Um, then A became a negative 1 when I subtracted them. Oh, so it's, it's in an infinite loop. As long as they're not equal to each other, which they're not, so A is 5, B is 6, then if A is greater than B, which it's not, so we're going to take B and set it equal to B minus A. So B is 1. Right? B is equal to B minus A. So what it actually did is it went into, it set A equal to A minus B. That's where we got the negative 1. So our fraction is greater, failed us. This function didn't work. So if the length of A, which should be a 1, is less than the length of B, which it's not in this case, 5 and 6, same length. Else, if the length of B is less than the length of A, which it's not, otherwise we're going to go through A and B, which have the same length, and what we're going to do is we're going to take A at character 0, which should be a 5, is 5 less than B at bucket 0? It is. So we'll return true. A is, in fact, less than B. Actually, I know that I know those will work. So what we saw by our output. So five is less than b. Just five. We should have done this one. So what we asked is 5 greater than 6, and we got a true from that. So right off the bat, we got the wrong answer from is greater. So that's our, our problem was with is greater. So let me print out... A length is a dot two string dot length. And B length, our hope is both of these are one. Is it a plus sign, maybe? Oh, hold on, it's up here. Okay, so they're both one. Length is both one, so that's good. So we know that is fine. So we know that A's length is not less than B's length. We know that B's length is not less than A's length. Therefore, we're going to come into this else. <clears throat> and 
Okay, so we got into the NLs. So we're definitely here. So now we're going to walk through A and B. So what I want to do is I want to I want to print out these numbers. Num A is equal to that. Num B is equal to that. We want to get zero for both of these. So we should get five and six. Num A is five, num B is six. Okay. <clears throat> So if 5, oh, haha, <laughs> so we asked here is 5 Originally, we said is five less than six. The answer is yes. So we return true that five is greater than six. So that's not right. So we really want to say is five <coughs> greater than or equal to six. Is that right? If five is greater than or equal to six, we're going to return true. necessarily say that it's greater than if it's equal to. No, I think we need to say just greater than. So if 5 is greater than 6, return true. It's not, so we'll spin back through. We'll go to the next one. We don't have one, so we'll return false. That should be correct. Okay, so I think is greater should work now, but let's let's test is greater before we do anything else. So we're gonna go into hello. We'll comment out these couple lines, and we'll do system dot out dot println. Fraction dot is greater. Oh, I'm damn it, private. I did. Let's just make this public for right now, just to test it. So we'll say fraction dot is greater, and we're going to pass it a new big integer one and a new big integer two. Is 1 greater than 2? It is not, so we should get a false. Is 1 greater than 2? Right now, I get it. So let's. This is. So this is one and two. Are they the same are, is one longer than the other one. No, no. So now we have one and two. So, but we're only going to go through this loop one time. So we're at bucket zero, right? So we're going to get integer at percent a at bucket zero, which should be a one. Is one greater than a two? No. So we're not going to return true. But we did return true. Oh, 
A 1 is not greater than a 2. Integer dot percent. I'm going to take the string version of A and get the character at bucket 0, concatenate that onto the empty string. This should give us the integer. Well, that should give us the string 1, and then parsing that should give us the number 1. Is the number 1 greater than the number 2? No. So since that's false, we'll skip past this, go to this 4. So we should be returning a false from here. All right, so here we're going to we're going to do something interesting. I'm going to show you how to use a debugger. So I just toggled a breakpoint, I think, didn't I? I don't see it in there, but... So I'm going to go to debug here. We can also do it from up, up here. And I'm going to run this in debug mode. What it's going to do is it's going to stop at the line I set the breakpoint on. Okay? So it should show me the current value of things. Now I have... Uh, where's my... Here we go. So I'm going to step over some of these lines. So I'll step over here. Uh, where does it give me my values in this guy? Can I just highlight over? Yep, so i is currently 0. So right here, i is 0, which means right here, i is 0. All right. Um, can I get what a is? So a... is 1. So what I have highlighted there is 1. Is 1 greater than B, which is a 2? So let's step over. Why? The integer version of 1 is not greater than the integer version of 2. I feel like I'm on the crazy pills. Let's see. I'm going to take this number and I'm going to subtract from it this number. And so in our example here, a 1 minus a 2 should give us a negative 1. Correct? All right, so I'm expecting this guy to print out a negative one. <laughs> Is it looking at white? Am I matching parentheses wrong? That closes that one. This one closes this one, right? This whole thing is going to boil down to an integer. And that integer should be the integer 1. This asks the question, if the integer 1 is greater than this guy, which is the integer, so this closes this, this closes that, so this is the integer 2. If the integer 1 is greater than the integer 2, Oh, ah, 
I may have even referenced that early on in this uh, one of our classes early on. I had a semicolon here at the end of this line. So I was never getting in. This thing was being completely ignored. The return true was just happening. Of course I did that on purpose. Okay, so now now it seems to be working a little bit a little bit better, a little bit more bestest, most bestest. Okay. Seems to be <laughs> accurately reducing now. Um, let's see. Let's do four eighths. Oh, that's correct, right? One over one. It's a really a horrible example. Two eighths. This should be eight sixteenths plus. Four sixteenths, so twelve sixteenths. So it'd be six eighths, four fourths. So why did this break? Let's see where it crash. Oh, I got a negative number out of it. All right, so this would be. 8 sixteenths plus 4 sixteenths, that's 12 sixteenths, 6 eighths, 3 fourths. That should be 3 fourths, so now what we need to do is we need to come in here and we're still breaking on our is greater. It's broken here. Comparing Okay, so that's where we screwed up right there. So we got another negative. So first time we were comparing 12 to 16. Let's go to is greater. Well, actually, we should be able to look at our output. Twelve to sixteen is twelve greater than sixteen? No. Is twelve greater than four? No. Is twelve greater than negative eight? That's where we that's where we failed. So is twelve we kept coming here. So B equals B dot distract uh, distract subtract A subtract A. So that's sixteen is equal to sixteen minus twelve. So B becomes 4. Great. Is 12 greater than 4? It is. But we didn't treat it as it being greater. 12 has a length of 2. 4 has a length of 1. So we need to go into our greater. If the length of A... Oh, I'm backwards here too. Jeez. The length of A is greater than the length of B, return true, it's bigger. If the length of B is greater than, man, I tested you guys while we were writing this. 
All this headache over us, by us I mean me, insisting that we write our own is greater function. <laughs> I li we literally wrote all of it backwards. I, what I wrote was is less than. I meant to write is greater, but I, write is, I wrote is lesser, is less than, whatever. Okay, so <laughs> I think this solves the problem. Yeah, it, do, it does. This this works for this works for this. So now we should be able to create a bunch of random fractions. And we've done random numbers, right? So we'll start this guy off as a new fraction. One, two, because we have that, that long one. And I'm going to create a random r is equal to new random for int i is equal to zero. I is less than a thousand. I plus plus. We're going to say sum is equal to sum dot add. new fraction r dot well I'll cheat a little bit r dot next long now we do it this way um We can't do a zero. This would just make my life a lot easier for doing this little example because we're testing our whole time complexity issue here. So I just want to add up a whole bunch of gigantic All right, so a thousand times I'm going to take my starting point, which is the fraction one half, and I'm going to keep adding to it a new fraction whose numerator is some random number between one and a hundred thousand, and whose denominator is some random number between one and a million. Well, we'll start with a hundred thousand, and we'll just keep building that up. In the end, after that loop's done, we'll say sum dot display. And the hope is this actually runs fairly quickly. And we're dealing with some really large fractions. Oh, well, this is not going to run quickly, but it actually gives me a good reason to tell you. See how slow this is running? And watch how much quicker it runs here in a second. Let me 
that's going in is greater. Where am I printing that? Mm -hmm. Oh, here we go. <laughs> Shut up! Everybody relax! Yeah, another negative number? Oh my gosh. What's up? Well, I definitely only got positive numbers, I think, here. All right, next time. I added one to this to make sure I never had a denominator of zero. So that should be a number between zero and 100,000. Adding one to it should be a number between one and 100,000. Let me just display some each time. Let's see when we went south. All right after that. Should have worked. Well, I think R dot next then should give me a number between zero and a hundred thousand. That version of it. And just for the sake of argument here, let's just keep adding one half over and over again. <laughs> yeah, but that worked. So let's add 1,000 over 2 million. Am I just like sucking at hitting the play button? Right. Just for the sake of my own sanity for a second. come down here and for add we're gonna say instead of this line 
we're going to say big integer dot or g div is equal to big integer dot actually it must be new num dot gcd new denom let's just use their built-in gcd okay now let's run it with bigger numbers like I was trying to run it with. Yeah, it runs faster. Yeah, our the way we were doing greater must have just been inefficient enough that this was taking too long. <coughs> so our version of greater was was not not efficient. So we built in a new time complexity problem into it. So now with this, I think I should be able to do um, r dot next int. Let's just do one thousand plus one, and I'll explain here before we take a break. So now we need one plus one. Okay, good. So clearly, I'll just run it again real quick. We see we got gigantic fraction. I haven't even got to the slash yet. Or maybe I passed it, but you can see we have a huge fraction there. Much bigger than a int or a long could hold. And it ran pretty quickly. So our ghetto version of greater was uh, lacking. Greatly, pun intended. <laughs> You know, there really used to be functions for comparing big integers. Less than, greater than. I really thought so. Because, as I see it, using R is greater. So, just real quick, let me just, let me just test something here real quick. It should break on us pretty quickly. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to return a dot int value greater than b dot int value. So I'll just get the integer values of them. But right off the bat there, what we've done is we've limited the value size we can hold inside of a big integer to the size of an int into a single big integer. So now if I scroll down and I go back to my old version of GCD, yeah, I think we're going to break again because it's going to circle back around and give us negative numbers. So the only way to truly do this is write a more efficient version of greater. Comparing big integers Yeah, there's got to be like a mathematically sound way of doing it Where you take one and subtract another In fact, I'm positive the functions used to be dot gt dot lt less than greater than Hmm interesting Well in any, way, in any case, if we had just decided to solve the problem using our, the built-in GCD function, we could have pulled it off. Um, I think that our version of greater works now. And I think if we allowed the code to sit and run, it would give us the correct answer eventually. But I think we added in our own um, time complexity issue to it. But in any case, we saw some uh, uh, interesting debugging and things like that there, so it wasn't a total waste. So that was the homework. <laughs> As you can see, it takes about 15 minutes if you do it the easy way, or <laughs> two hours if you do it in an interesting way. Well, it took us like an hour and 20 minutes, an hour and 15 minutes. Um, okay, questions about any of that? Before we take a break, and then we'll come back and... Um, start doing some new things. Questions, comments, concerns, bribes.
All right, it's 8.15. Uh, why don't we take a 15-minute break, come back at 8.30. Sound good?